Today, I am joined by my friend Dan Dima. He is a um, Romanian political analyst, I would say. He's a very learned man. Uh, he's uh, someone that I've personally learned uh, a lot from. Um, he's a conservative person uh, of a very specific blend of, uh, you know, h historical awareness and uh, uh, erudition and Yeah, I mean, I guess he, he's also probably the closest thing we have to a kind of a Curtis Yarvin figure in, in Romania, which is, I think, high praise on this podcast, because as people know, we really like Curtis Yarvin. So uh, welcome, Dan. Uh, thank you. Thank you for having me. And hello, everyone. Yeah, it's it's great to have you on. Finally, I've been planning uh, this episode for a while in my mind. I haven't talked to you about it, uh, but um, because you know this this podcast typically is oriented towards my audience that kind of organically formed to be in the U.S., Canada, the U.K., very much kind of an Anglo podcast, uh, and a lot of people were asking me, okay, details about okay, what's going on in Eastern Europe? What what's you know what is the political situation like in Romania? You know what is you know conservatism like in Romania? And to be honest. I'm not that much of an expert. I've lived abroad for a long time. I have kind of a vague awareness of what's going on, um, a vague malaise about it all because it all seems so retarded whenever I go on to <laughs> Facebook where, you know, things happen. And then if I want to, you know, get an update of what's going on, I go onto your page <laughs> to, and, and get my news from there. Uh, and it, it does seem like even, even your assessment of it is that it is quite retarded at this point. So, um, yeah, I wanted to have you on to, to just kind of you know, use your, um, the fact that you're connected to all of this and the fact that you also kind of have this um, historically informed backbone of, of, you know, all the reading that you've done um, to, to, to bring context to it all. So, um, yeah, this is super broad, but essentially the, the, the question is like, how do you, how do you see, um, you know, what's going on politically in Romania right now, especially in contrast to what's going on in the West? Because we had a conversation before this podcast where we were saying that, Even the concepts, you know, the basic concepts of left and right are not, you know, that um, easily understood. And don't, they don't overlap perfectly with what's going on in, in Western Europe and what's going on in Eastern Europe. So if you could just elaborate on that, that'd be great. Well, um, to, to be sure, we, what, what, what I had in mind was the notion that traditionally the left and the right do not overlap perfectly when it comes to comparing the West to Romania or to Eastern Europe in general for reasons that uh, we we will go into. But uh, at the same time, I'm not sure that the concepts of left and right correspond to anything in the West as, as we stand now. Um, in Romania, it has, al it has always been, um, well, not necessarily, I mean, um, a, a variant, let's say, of what they used to call continental conservatism, um, in that the the main themes of debate uh, in the Anglo-Saxon world were never part of the, um, let's say, the, the, the focus, the political focus in Romania. Uh, very many uh, characteristics of uh, British conservatism and of what Americans consider to be central to conservatism today were not part of uh, Romanian conservatism, however you may define it, or were marginally part of it. Uh, somebody calling themselves a conservative and adding in the English sense would have been in a minority up to the, at least, uh, uh, World War I. Uh, though, presumably, that wasn't necessarily a, uh, um, the, the most relevant factor since being in a minority did not constitute, uh, you weren't, it, it wasn't a dem democratic or a fully democratic Uh, a repre representative system. So the conservatives were the party of the restrained uh, vote, the, the, the uh, uh, let's say, the um, census suffrage, um, where, where you would have represent, representation given to people higher up in the, in the social and economic hierarchy over representation to them. So that's conservatism as it originally was in Romania. Uh, very uh, proudly non-representative. Um, and to sum it up, that that uh, generation died out before World War I or by the time of World War I. So most Romanians, when they think of conservatism, or not, I'm not sure most Romanians, but historically most Romanians would have, would have seen it as something that has died out in the past and everyone is progressive now to 
to a certain degree. Um, yeah. So, so what they have now as conservatism is something that's conservatism rediscovered, and it has all the um, all the paradoxes associated with that. It's the conservatism that was uh, rediscovered and reshaped to reflect either a very uh, very popular, uh, very populist uh, version of things, or a very, um, um, let's say, a, um, an, an, an another way of saying neoliberal or a neoconservative, which isn't, uh, I, I wouldn't say it's politically relevant, but it has been able to blend into or with the populist trend for a while. Yeah. Yeah, it did seem like that was kind of the the wave that that was pushed, you know, kind of neoliberal neoconservatism, uh, also kind of in the um, and you know orange revolutions uh, and and kind of that that was what um, it, it melded in a way. You know, the European Union was part of a populist wave and even a kind of a, a center right wave where we had kind of this this um, market capitalist idea that okay, Europe represents market capitalism. That's what we want. That's a right wing idea. But then we brought that in, uh, and just from my perception, it seems that it's melded in with everything else that the European Union represent, which is not right wing in any uh, conception of the word. Indeed, and let me remind you and um, your uh, followers as well uh, that uh, it used to be. It, it also used to disguise itself as populist conservatism. Uh, the, the, the word it went by, the name it went by, was uh, European People's Party. We had a uh, democratic party heralding this, uh, this change. We had uh, people who proudly called themselves peoples, populists, and, uh, and whatnot, representing precisely that, uh, that neoliberal and pro-EU uh, faction, which for a while was genuinely popular as long as people associated uh, right wing with Europeanism, and uh, and that was an uh, that that's it's it's in the past now. Uh, it's starting to unravel, but that was the uh, the political culture, let's say, around two thousand and six. Yeah, and and what you're seeing now, I mean, what what is this? Is there a, a genuinely uh, conservative, either in the Anglo tradition or continental tradition party now in Romania? You as a conservative, would you have anyone to vote for at the at this point? Um, I would have somebody to vote for, but only only by abstracting things that I would have to think are think of as not not entirely up my alley, not not representative of me. But presumably that's what everybody needs to do uh, in 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 their in their relevant context. But so so I wouldn't struggle for perfection in that area. Um, but I certainly wouldn't uh, in in this context, in the context we are now, we're in now. I would rather um, vote for a party that is unabashedly populist and. Um, Including in, and it includes uh, um, staples of uh, non uh, of, of continental thought, non uh, Anglo-Saxon, non-Atlantic thought. Then uh, voting for uh, then to vote for a uh, a party that supposedly stands for uh, for um, neoconservatism in the whether it's in the American or in the European pseudo-American sense. Mm. And what, what would populism mean today in, in Romania? What like what, what would, the, would the major issues be uh, for one of these parties? Populism in, in, uh, in uh, generic terms, in whatever it may pop up, is a return to what politics were meant to be, at least in a, in a democratic paradigm. Uh, it's, it's quite unfathomable, unfathomable to me why there would be a um, a political movement within democracy that is not populist. Mm -hmm. uh, as long as you accept dem democracy as a paradigm, everyone should be populist. Everyone should be representative of the people. Everyone should strive to have a 
a doctrine that fits well with at least some of the interests that people have. The very fact that we accepted that there, that this is a struggle between populists and non-populists suggests that the game has been rigged to some extent. Yeah, I mean, populism is just essentially what you call democracy you don't like. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> and, uh, and more and more uh, democracy itself, like the, the manifestation of democracy, because... Um, uh, the other side is a special interest group, more interest groups more than it is the popular vote. So you have a an on um, a, a duking out between uh, the popular vote, people who uh, po- politicians who at least strive to um, be representative of somebody in society. In, in, in where the locus of decision in society is. And on the other side, you would have people who represent special interest groups, like interest groups, sorry, like NGOs or um, uh, corporate interests or uh, um, well, whatever else there may be, even, uh, even trade unions yeah. or the, the professional organizations of some sort. It is, I think we're at the point where it's very hard to disentangle the special interest groups, especially kind of on the, you know, neocon, neoliberal end. You know, the NGOs are very much entangled with the state, with the super national organizations. They all fund each other uh, and with the corporations as well, because, you know, the kind of the, the libertarian split between what state, what is corporation. It's not very clear at all. You know, these are these are one big cabal. Yes. And um it's not just that they're a cabal, but um, a special interest group have as their ultimate purpose a takeover of the state. Um, it's it's out in the open. If you if you generalize the notion that capitalism is uh, includes at least includes um, situations where you would have contractors supplying social services, and those contractors contractors are NGOs or their financial backers. Uh, the moment you accept that notion, you accept that the state does not belong to the voters, uh, that the voters, uh, and and does not belong to itself either. It, it doesn't even belong to the bureaucracy. It's the b- bureaucracy submerged by special interest groups um, and uh, voters and taxpayers, more than voters, as the, the resource, the exploitable resource. They're not uh, the... The, not even the decision makers, but that's saying too little. They're not even um, relevant parts of the process. They are the product, let's say. The, yeah. the, the end game is um, to get as much as you can from the voters and the taxpayers. And, and I'm sure your, your followers know this intuitively. And if they don't know it intuitively, they surely know it from examples in their immediate backgrounds. It's that doesn't change from Canada to Romania to Antigua or to to Spain. It is the same, and we let it be the same. Um, a lot of time was spent on ideological preparedness for this. Um, if you look back in the past, we were at a stage where we still largely controlled the process, or at least we weren't entirely. Um, it wasn't entirely out of our hands, and we were persuaded to to relinquish control at various levels, whether it was the left with its special interest groups or the right with its special interest groups. Um, the end result was was uh, privatizing, let's say, the political, privatizing or corporatizing the political to where it doesn't belong to, to, the, to the people. I want to add that it's probably not, uh, it, 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 it's not, democracy is not the ultimate the most relevant model. It is a compromise. But it is a compromise that we accepted under certain terms. Um, Let's say uh, Spaniards uh, relinquished uh, dictatorship, a benevolent dictatorship, a dictatorship that got things working for most of them. They returned to democracy under certain assumptions and certain promises that were made to them. If you look back on the in the last 40 years, what happened was that they started subtracting from that uh, from that promise in Spain, 
let's just use this relevant example, to where democracy is probably worse now and a blend of, of, of corruption and incompetence that is at, at any of its, uh, in any of its manifestations, it's, it's below um, whatever the Franco regime was in the 1970s in any case. And now you have the popular reaction, which is anti-democratic to some degree, at least it looks to a system that was not democratic, democratic, and it wants to achieve through democracy the same results as that. And it is maligned and marginalized by the people who took control of the democratic system. It's a paradox in a way because populism has to look back to authoritarianism, to at least to a certain degree, because that's when things worked. It, it's We are at the stage when authoritarian rule that claimed to represent nobody didn't make any point or didn't make any, any had no qualms about saying that it does not represent the people, it represents somebody who's better than the people, who knows better than the people, which is also a, a conservative, or at least a continental conservative tradition. Um, but we have that that uh, that uh, sort of mindset, which had had its evident results. And we have a populist movement going through democratic channels, now trying to achieve the same results and looking back to that as a relevant paradigm, because it is. Yeah, it's like uh, the the conversations that I keep hearing in the U.S. about um, our democracy. Well, all democracy expects results that are essentially anti-democratic, you know, and if you're not getting the results that our democracy accepts, then the democracy itself is at fault, you know. Um, you know, something is is vitiating the minds of the people. Um, and I think it's, it's also kind of draws back, as you said, that, you know, we were kind of ideologically prepared for this. And I feel like the, the, the kind of philosophical seeds for this were the idea that, um, of, of management, of, you know, of that there is a science of statecraft, there is a science of politics, a science of this and that, and that the expert class is educated and they're the only people allowed. And of course, we've bred, you know, a cast of NGOs, a cast of super notional organisms uh, where, um, you know, these experts live and where they credential each other and they, you know, gather at Davos and, and you know, congratulate each other on, on all the wonderful things that they're, they're you know, moving and shaking. Um, and this is a language that, pretty much everyone accepts now, you know, it's like in Romania, we have the, all like the, the British researchers have found, that's like a very common, like clickbait headline. What, what have the British researchers found now? Uh, and it's this framing that, you know, there's someone out there who's really looked at this and all the complexity of our world, because our, our world is like very obviously complex, you know, how does the microwave work? We don't know. Someone knows. The experts know. Uh, and, you know, downstream from all these technological miracles, there has to be someone who knows how the state works, who knows how the Federal Reserve works, knows how money works and all of that stuff. Uh, the reality is that, um, yeah, it doesn't it doesn't work quite that way. And it's really disempowered us politically. Uh, and it's taken, like you said, populism out of the game. And now it's trying uh, to make its way back. Yes. And... Um I will add that uh, at its worst, um, uh, the authoritarian system. Let's let's say fascism is the worst we got in in Europe, in Western Europe. Fascism is the worst we got out of this uh, this authoritarian um, shift from the excesses of democracy. In Eastern Europe, of, of course, it's it's communism. You can't get get worse than communism. But in both cases, and particularly in fascism. The notion was that uh, power does not belong to you, but to people who know how to exercise it. Um, fascism was uh, coherent in its reaction against uh, against communism. It was coherent in its ability to channel uh, popular energies. Let's say, uh, still saying that people are not, though they're not represented electorally, they're represented in the mind and spirit of the in the energy of the ruling party, and so on. So it did have that sort of discourse, which legitimized it. And um, in, it in Italy, at least, it created a benign paradigm where things just worked and, uh, and people were content. But as part of that process, it invented the expert class uh, as an additional legitimation. You can't, you won't, uh, or rather, um, the, the, the fascist party knows it in itself is a representation of society. It doesn't need people to vote. And 
in order to justify why it would take that measure, which is unpopular or, or at least not very popular, it has experts who know who are uh, uh, the, the the best trained sons of the people, who are in a position to who are qualified to 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 do this and that, to to train the population for war, to dig channels, to um, make trains uh, run on time, as uh, as the as the saying went, they had. They invented the expert class, or at least they exploited the existence of an expert class. And then it's it's uh, bewildering to have this uh, pseudo-democratic uh, current system doing the same, achieving the same, um, reaching the same uh, paradigm, while still while still pretending to be representative. This is this is peculiar. Yeah, I think you know that the. the, the core problem here feels to me that, you know, there, there is a, a need for legitimacy. There is a need for, um, yeah, sovereignty based on what. And I feel like it's just, just because of technology and how things have played out, you know, after the, the Industrial Revolution, it makes sense um, kind of intuitively that the experts should be the people that legitimate this. Uh, and I feel like the only opposite pole of... of um, Sovereignty would be um, religious, or kind of a, a you know this the divine right of kings, or some sort of divine right whereby you know the the, the you have political stability because there is that legitimacy. Mm-hmm. Um, do you see that a possibility outside of this, like a secular legitimacy that is not necessarily based on? I don't know, <laughs> weird autistic people who... <laughs> well, um, before there was an expert hijacking of the divine right, um, there was, let's say, a, a national slash nationalist um, exploitation of the divine right, mimicry of the, of the divine right. Um, this is probably the continental um, characteristic that is almost entirely lacking, or at least it's very hard to approximate in the West. Um, in in Europe, um, we went through a nationalist stage where the divine, we took the divine right from the kings, or at least we shared it with the kings and the nation. The notion that the nation, that there was, that the things you were doing were, for the, were to benefit a nation or your nation more precisely. This is a very imperfect paradigm, obviously so, and it has created its own absurdities and excesses. But it is a legitimate paradigm, and in any case, it is a more legitimate paradigm than the supranational expert class interest group uh, we're venturing into. And the people, and not just people, but the people know this to be the fact. And this is, this is why... Um, Conservatism returns as populism, and populism assumes the trappings of nationalism, or at least they're they're in a symbiosis. They are um, not just populists, but also nationalists, in the sense that they look at uh, at the divine right of their uh, their uh, particular society as being uh, as being the source of legitimacy. So, not that I would say this is the third way between your two uh, alternatives. But it, it appears to have to have been identified by the people them, by the peoples themselves mm-hmm. as as being the third uh, the third alternative, and it, well, it probably was created for that purpose. It's um, it's a bit ironic in a way because the notion that the divine right can be transferred to the people and their nation is a revolutionary, or at least was in its day and age a revolutionary notion. Uh, we are a conservative. We have a conservatism, paradoxically, for being a, a much older continent than uh, than America, we have a, a conservatism, that, conservatism that is built on something that's much newer but and ideological rather than, than doctrinaire. Uh, it belongs to a moment in, in time when ideology ruled the mind. When you can reconstruct the known universe um, with, uh, with internal or external revolutions. So it belongs to that stage. It's paradoxical. It's highly imperfect, but it is the most legitimate that we have. And both the people know it, as I mentioned, but also the the uh, the ruling class knows it. It knows that this is the thing the thing to watch out for, the thing to to identify as being the problem. And if you look at the propaganda that is centered 
own questioning or uh, subverting national identity, I think it refers to that. Yes, it, it does seem that even even in, in the Anglosphere, there's nothing more uh, radioactive than um, coalescing around, you know, the the ethnos or you know just uh, just just nationalism. There's always the, the attack is always that oh, this is incoherent. These are you know made up variables. Like it's, mm-hmm. you can see by the viciousness of the attacks that something you know a tripwire has been has been set yes. off. And we, we have to pass off as fans of national identity or uh, or ethnic identity. We, we would have to pass for, pass for that uh, as long as the, 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 the discourse is set to where you can't possibly find any merit to it. This is also part of the of the conditioning. The moment you say, well, it probably isn't that bad, you are a fan of, of, of national, not just nationalism, but extreme nationalism. And you would like um, Mussolini, not to say uh, the other guy, <laughs> back in power. <laughs> yes. Of course, uh, yeah. That, yeah. That's essentially what I've noticed with the, the Russia discourse. <laughs> Very <laughs> much like uh, I've, I've had some kind of um, just maybe more open open-minded, you know, keep keeping an open mind type people on the podcast. And I've gotten, I, I, I've I talked about all sorts of, you know, subversive topics on this podcast, but nothing has given me more vicious backlash. Like people writing me that they want me to, you know, be raped by the Russian soldiers in front of my infant child and like things like that, just like very unhinged people um, and, and very persistent unhinged people. Uh, but yeah, this is like the only actual pushback I've, I've gotten on like a significant topic. And it seems to be the thing that um, divides the right thinking and the, and the wrong thinkers mostly right now, though it seems to kind of slowly die down because it's probably just as hard to keep the energy for the current thing. Yes. Yes. That's, that's, I, I think it's dying down to at least to, to the relevant degree. But um, I, would, I would like to point out here that what they're doing by manipulating people on this level is that they're um, cynically using uh, probably the most nationalist position that you could possibly have uh, against, against uh, populism. Mm-hmm. So in this specific moment in time, what you see is people who pretend to be right-wing and who direct the discourse toward the, the, the end goals of, of the European Union and other transnational institutions, who um, mindlessly, or uh, well, probably not mindlessly, in fact, uh, very, very um, self aware, they're very self aware, very, very aware of what they're doing. Um, they're manipulating not just anti Russian discourse, but an anti Russian discourse that they know is traditional in countries like Romania and Poland because it ties to national identity. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is also because to simply go for an anti-Soviet uh, discourse at this stage would be saying too little. This Russia isn't the Soviet Union anymore. Not, it's not far from it, but it's not the Soviet Union. Everybody can 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 go back in time. People who lived through the 90s can remember that in 1991, they sat in front of their televisions and they looked and cheered on, in most cases, as... Uh, Boris Yeltsin uh, raised the Russian flag instead of the Soviet flag on the Red Square. At that moment in time, there were non-Russians in the Soviet Union that were more attached to the Soviet Union than the the, the core Russian movement was. Uh, And in fact, even this Russian nationalism at that stage was endorsed by the West. It was the way to go forward. We were told that Yeltsin was a hero for doing this. And so there was a, a, an evident denying of, of, the, of the Soviet identity, which has its repercussions today as well. Um, Putin cannot and probably does not want to go full Soviet in any way. He, he wants to base his worldview, his uh, system of beliefs on being Russians, Russian and on Russian imperialism. The, recreating the Russian Empire, not the Soviet Empire, not uh, not the multinational communist, uh, uh, where you would have to pretend to, uh, and you know, in, not just you would have to pretend to share powers between nationalities, but you would also have to find yourself from time to time ruled by somebody who was not a Russian. Most 
famously and infamously Stalin. Mm -hmm. So um, they know, the propagandists of today know that people want, that that they themselves can't go for an anti-Soviet discourse because it's not the Soviet Union that they're facing. And they also want to emphasize that they will not accept any, This has, I have seen them pointing this fact out, that they will not accept any alternative to Putin in Russia. Um, some go straight for the notion that when they win this Orwellian war, they will split Russia into, into provinces, self-ruling provinces and whatnot. They goad, goad people into thinking that Russia itself is a, relevant as a multinational state, that the Russians are a minority in that state, which is people aren't, they, they should pick up a map and, and, and verify this. For, uh, um, they will find out that, that um, while the Russians maintain various autonomous regions for various nationalities that are non-Russians, most of those regions are in fact 40 to 70 percent Russian. So for, for traditional reasons, uh, uh, Russians will maintain a, a Republic of Karelia, right? Which is, it's probably, it's, it's 80% Russians. There are only 20% Karelians living in Karelia. So they know, they know all of this as they, they, uh, they goad people along. And what they want in this situation is that they want you to think that Russians, as uh, in, in, in their every incarnation, in their every... Uh, civilian incarna incarnation, let's say, regular Russians, people walking the streets in Moscow are the enemy, are uh, incompatible with with, uh, with anything. That, that, that The only way to, to move forward is to have them uh, re-educated or uh, uh, massacred or whatnot. And they actually, they, they go for that, uh, for that element. And they know that what they will appeal to in Romania is the instinct that is not just anti-communist, but it's anti-Russian. It's also a, a brainchild of communism, uh, of, of, uh, of a very Romanian communism in a way, because communism in Romania at, at uh, its very late stage had to be at the same time pro-communist and anti-Russian. Mm -hmm. And in order to be anti-Russian, it, 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 it could not be anti-Soviet because the Soviet was an improvement on the Russian design. So what they went for was saying, well, the Russian is the, 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 the old legacy, old Russia is the problem. When in fact, old Russia is the least of our problems and was the least of our problems. As I'm sure people, you know, people, there are conservatives out there who, I'm not, I don't approve of them worshiping the Tsarist Russia, let's say. But it's a very... It, it, you, you can't possibly look at Tsarist Russia and say, well, that's not a political, it's a, it's a criminal system on the scale that, that Putin is, Putin's is, or on the scale that, that the Soviet Union is. It's, as far as, uh, as Russia can go, it's, uh, it's their, uh, their variant of, of normal conservatism, of keeping things uh, well-governed. So, so to to adopt the discourse where you would attack, um, attacking Russia and Russians, you would attack every institution in Russia, including those that are at least marginally legitimate. Is um, is is not just absurd; it's also appealing to the very uh, to the most radical circles of Romanian nationalism or Polish nationalism, and they're doing this like to them it's like using a Kleenex. They will do it, and then they'll discard the people they're uh, they're they're trying to rile up today. They will go against their interest the moment it stops suiting them. They get them energetic and and annoyed about Russia and ready to uh, wish rape on uh, on you. <laughs> they get them into that state. They got them into that state because, um, but but knowing full well that that. Uh, the next, uh, the next uh, chapter in, in the succession is where they get them to adhere to globalist ideals of the uh, of the European Union and whatnot. Um, yeah, it's it, it's an amazing form of cynicism. I, I I'm 
hard pressed to find something that that would resemble that outside of of communism. Yeah, I don't know if you've um, have you read the 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 Demon and Democracy, uh, the Richard Legutko book. Um, he was on on this podcast as well. He makes a very compelling argument that kind of the EU brand neoliberalism is essentially just a kind of denatured form of of communism, much more successful in, in many ways. And there's a quite a, a startling genealogy in in the book, so I definitely recommend it to to people who haven't read it. Um, uh, but yeah, it's it what you're saying about you know this this dehumanization campaign. It's it's startling even just you know. Being here in, in kind of my circles in, in, in Romania, uh, the more educated people that I know, they really are, have gone almost 100% into the, like, literally, these people are scum of the earth, insects that need to be crushed under the powerful boot of, you know, NATO or whoever shows up to, to save the day. Um, the people who are, you know, just like working class, they're just... They're, they're still normal because they're, I don't think they're just like maybe, I don't know, marinating in the internet culture around this stuff as much as people who, you know, allegedly are more educated. I would pinpoint another culprit for this. Um, again, I'm not sure what age these people you mentioned are, but I would assume that most of them, or at least their mentors for even younger ones, are people who are educated under communism. And people who identified, um, it's, a, it's a paradox, the people who identified the world of pre-communism um, as being better, and people who got the notion, uh, they got this notion from their parents and their grandparents, and some might have even gotten it in school through the filtered message of national communism, like Romanian communism, which was anti-Soviet. Uh, it's uh, again. It's it's amazing that they would po- polarize us against each other using um, the most uh, the most traditional, the most educated uh, manner of thinking. Let's say um, Romanians traditionally have simplified uh, everything to be well. It's it's the Russians. It's the Russians. It's the Russians that have done this and that. Uh, Romanians have a a a, um, a half remembrance of our relations with Russia, which were very bad uh, in half of their manifestations. They were at least neutral in their other half. And because of uh, very um, vivid traumas that Romanians felt as in uh, the takeover in Bessarabia or uh, Soviet occupation in the 50s and other things that, again, they would attribute they, they were goaded by the, the Romanian communists to attributing towards attributing to the Russians, to the Russians as a people, because the alternative would have been to attribute them to communism. And that would have been questioning Romanian communism as well. Um, so uh, there's because of, of those very, very traumatic events, um, they look back on history and they forget the half where um, I'm not going to say R- Russians were better because they weren't necessarily better, but many Romanians identified them as better, and those Romanians are relinquished to the garbage bin of history. One would be hard pressed to explain why, if uh, if we were so anti-Russians and so against, in every manifestation of Russia was against Romania. Why is it that in 1916 Romania joined the war on the same side as Russia and allowed Russian troops? to fight on Romanian territory. It's historical events like that, and, and they go way, they go back um, two centuries before that, where Russians, well, they were generally disappointing as a presence, not necessarily um, resented, but they, they continued, they kept on coming here and finding people with whom to at least uh, uh, do business. We were, uh, not sure your followers know this, but we were under Russian rule from 1822, I think, no, uh, 2027, uh, to, um, well, 1855, uh, I think, right? I mean, it's uh, up to the Crimean War, let's say. That's uh, 30 years of Russian rules, in Russian rule in which not... 
not many bad bad things happened. I'm not going to say they were all good, but uh, we still uh, Bucharest is still uh, still has a, a main faraway named after a uh, a Russian general who was governor of uh, Valachia at that point, and whom the Romanians uh, to whom the Romanians granted citizenship and who they wanted to elect as ruling prince of Valachia. Yes, I think a, a lot of people don't um, don't seem to understand that just kind of the, the, the geopolitical nature of of Eastern Europe is such that it's essentially kind of a, a kind of a place of intersection of, of, of very powerful forces, and that the idea of a protectorate of being you know you know vassal protectorate, call it what you may, but. Y- you have to kind of belong to someone in this, you know, intersection of, of, of vast empires. And like you said, you know, we've belonged to pretty much anyone who was competing in the area at one point. Transylvania belonged to the Austro-Hungarian Empire, very powerful co- colonist empire. We kind of have to, you know, be grateful to a lot of it because a lot of our administration, a lot of the beautiful buildings that we now use for tourism, a lot of the, the good things that exist here are a result of this, you know, colonialism or essentially a, a imperial moves that happen in the area. So, um, yeah, it's it's just, uh, you know, it's just not translatable into British politics or American mm-hmm. politics, just not the same type of, you know, the nature of it. So uh, the idea that, you know, a country like Ukraine is ever going to be, um, you know, a country like the U.S. Mm-hmm. is just, there's an impossibility to it that people just can't grasp. Well, I'm, I guess there, there would be, there would be um, ways to, to ponder and acknowledge similarities, but only if we were to look at, let's say, the relations, the relations between the U.S. and the U.K. after 1945, with the fall of the British Empire. I'm not sure it's entirely unfamiliar to either Brits or Americans. Uh, Britain has to look at itself, whatever happened in its relations with the with the United States, and the United States would have to look at themselves in relations to other countries. In relation to other countries, what 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 they are to other countries, the way in which uh, the US has managed its relations with other countries. Uh, it's uh, an, an enormous power with enormous potential for good or bad, um, acting on its neighbors. Um, in most cases, I, I would say that the US relation with other nations has been for the better, or at least not for the worst. But it can be used for the worst, and this has been shown in the past and is probably shown at the moment. Um, once you have, for instance, once you have a, uh, an administration that is bent on, uh, on uh, achieving net zero, uh, any, any country that would have to, would want to, to, to remain at, at once in the American orbit and industrialized has a problem. Um, but, but going back to, to Romania and, and Russia, um, there's also um, the, the the problem with uh, with uh, with Romania and well any country in Eastern Europe and Russia um, is also a geographic one, which can be summed up in the fact that um, um, once you get past Eastern Europe and its uh, shattered landscape, let's say its uh, its mountains and hills and uh, fortresses and whatnot. Um, you would have a very easy way breaking into into the plains of the Ukraine and Russia, all the way to Moscow. There's no stopping you. The Russians, whether you know, whatever we can say about their uh, um, their um, government governments being incompetent or ill willed, we can also look at at the fact that they have an objective fear, which has been stoked into them in the sixth, 17th century. Sorry, by the Poles when they invaded Russia and managed to occupy Moscow. And this has been repeated in, in, uh, in a more familiar history several times. Enough for the Russians to, or the Russian geostrategists, to believe that the best way to protect Russia is in somebody else's territory. Mm-hmm. As uh, Marx, Karl Marx put it in... in, in uh, in one of his uh, lesser, less, less, uh, um, less absurd uh, essays, where he was simply talking about European politics, made the observation, which is, I guess, is is relevant up to a point, still relevant today, 
that uh, the, the Russians West, Russia's western frontier runs from Tilsit in the north to Trieste in the south. That this is where the Russians would, would protect, would best protect themselves, that this is what they're seeking. I'm not sure that even Putin now is, is considering this as, as his geopolitical uh, strategy. <laughs> I presume not. I mean, he, he's not, he hasn't been acting uh, that uh, uh, imperialistic, let's say. It's, he's been less, uh, um, less imperialistic than that. But uh, it is an objective fact of Russian history. There's no going around it. And uh, people who are in the way and would want to preserve independence would have to have a guarantee against Russian expansionism. The big problem that we have now is that uh, the guarantee that we have against, against Russian in, in imperialism or expansionism is either incompetent, as the European Union, European Union is, or... Um, or uh, the EU is, or um, um, as grotesque as the Russians, as America and the EU both are becoming. Um, there's talk of, um, it's not just net zero that we're facing, it's we're facing social credit disguised as, as environmental credit. The moment our transactions will be controlled by central banks, uh, looking into whatever we consume and dictating or stopping us from consuming, simply stopping us, stopping the, stop, stopping the transaction from occurring. Um, once you look at that as being the perspective in the free world, um, you would have to question, well, why? Why is this the better alternative? Not that Russia is the better alternative, but that they're both the same. Mm -hmm. And uh, you look at, at propaganda again, and you can you can gauge uh, the where they're going with things. Um, simply in the sense that they're already arguing on the level. The, the implicit argument is, well, at least we're not Russia, and this can't possibly do anymore. And I'm sure the uh, the populists, and not just the populists, but People throughout the Eastern and Western world understand, understand that for a fact, even if it's just in, intuitively. Um, the New York Times just published a, uh, uh, did you see that, a, uh, a poll published by the New York Times? No. Um, um, the New York Times it, it's, uh, is apparently setting itself against the Biden administration, which is unusual. Mm -hmm. um, one would... If I'm optimistic, I would assume that they're doing it because they want to prevent a second. They, they, even the left has uh, ha, has become worried about the possibility of of uh, being defrauded again, of the elections being being uh, defrauded again by by uh, by the Biden regime. And so they want to to um, put as much of the narrative there, in contrast to what they were doing in the last election cycle, they want to skew the narrative towards where it becomes improbable that Biden would win the elections. Because it's just about the only thing you can do when once uh, Biden can, or, or his, uh, his backers can control the electoral system. You make it implausible that they actually won. Whereas he tries to make, make it as plausible that he did win. Because... Um, I mean, looking at, at the way he promotes various crises as occurring, uh, you have to look at, uh, at the climate crisis, yeah? and which is, which is another way of saying, well, people will turn up in droves to vote for me because I, I, I energized voters or whatever the, the, uh, the wooden tongue says um, about this issue. Like young voters turned up to vote for me because they care about school shootings, uh, they care about the climate, they care... And the New York Times published a poll, presumably a scientific poll. I'm not, I haven't looked into into the data. It is just I have only looked at, at the generic questions they were asking and the percentages they got. Percentages they got, and it appears that uh, around zero percent, between zero and one percent of Americans uh, care about 
about uh, the climate crisis, about uh, school shootings, or at least domestic terrorism, about any of the issues that Biden lays out there. Mm. So I think I think things are we we, we the the um, population that's ready to to still go for the uh, to to still follow the show to still uh, be in it for uh, for Biden's uh, obsessions is statistically irrelevant. Yeah, but they represent our democracy. <laughs> I'm not sure. I, they they represent the the game that has to be they, 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 whatever they're they're uh, they're using in lieu of uh, of democracy whatever they're they're uh, pretending is democracy but don't even have a uh, they, they don't even bother um, presenting it as as even presenting it as a democracy yeah. it's just democ- inertial democracy it's. Yeah, there's a, there's always a a, a race um, between how fast uh, you know a a system built on lies can collapse and how fast they can you know bring up these narratives to to to, to prop prop up this you know Lenin's corpse. Um, <laughs> it's uh, it's we'll have to see because I think you know now things are starting to break in a very tangible way and I mean even even here in Romania you can see inflation going through the roof. Obviously, they're trying to say it's you know Putin's price hikes and things like that. You know how many people believe this, just given the fact that people still remember how inflation happens. I understand that, you know, maybe the Wikipedia page, you know, changed into modern monetary theory in the meantime. But still, if you print money and if you just constantly bail out economies destroyed by, you know, waves upon waves of emergencies like COVID, like everything else has been an emergency for for a very long time. Climate now, um, you know, people still kind of remember why inflation happens. And it's, you know, it's clear where the money gets printed. But but is there end game? One would really have to 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 look into this. Is the end game um, that they want to cover up their inflation, inflationary policy, or is the end game that they want they simply want to control the way they bring it, they bring down hard currency? Mm. Because you know you would assume uh, if it's the former, then um, the narrative is untangling and. And uh, and uh, the people are about to do something about it, and it's going to matter. But if it's the latter, then whatever happens is to their advantage. Mm-hmm. Um, even the, I mean, it's not uh, it's not an optionless uh, situation. But even in that case, we 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 would have to know what what we are facing. And on one hand, and on the other hand, um, we would have to look into whether the next move is, um, I'm going to be blunt about it, whether it's um, state terror, as uh, the, whether they're moving into unabashed terror. And uh, looking at the way things have been arranged for a while, it looks like, it, it looks uh, uh, at least as if they're trying to do that. Um I think that the, the brouhaha at January 6th or whatever it was, was um, there the way in which uh, people who control the system signaled to those questioning them what would happen the moment people... Um, it, it was like a general rehearsal. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is what happens when you come with the pitchforks so no one dares. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's. I mean, I think aren't most of the people who were, you know, captured January sixth still detained without, mm-hmm. without, without any word about them. Mm-hmm. They're, they're, yeah, just persona non grata, just disappeared them. We have political theater to justify it in the, in the Congress, in mm-hmm. Congress. Yeah, um, it's been billed as as, as prime time. Uh, so they've essentially kind of moved it into the prime time, which is an interesting thing because. Nowadays, you don't really have prime time, so it's not necessarily for a, for like a young audience. This is for people who still watch television. Mm-hmm. Prime time, yeah. So it's it's ve- it's a very strange. Uh, well, it would make sense because even in the poll I mentioned, the people who are most likely to buy into Biden's narratives are the boomer generation or whatever yeah. is left of it. 
<laughs> the boomers, the poor boomers. There's uh, there are a few boomers, at least a handful listening to the show. I'm sorry, guys, we don't mean you, but yes, uh, there, there's there's definitely you know a seed of a seed of uh, of disaster in that generation. Yeah, I think uh, there's um, there was you had a, an interesting post that you sent me before this, and I um, I think it's kind of ties into this whole idea that you know your feeling is that this is less of a emergent situation, more of a Maybe not like planned by one person, but it's there's definitely a plan behind it, and uh, you kind of tie it into the the whole kind of uh, great great reset narrative and things like that. I mean, I I, I wonder. Not I'm not going to ask you who do you think is behind this because we kind of know. I mean, they they have a forum. They 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 meet. It's it's clear who these people are. Um, but. Uh, I I wonder what kind of the, the the next step would be for you know just just you know living living our lives in, in in these conditions. I mean, what what is your kind of contingency plan? You know, there's nowhere to go. That's the thing. You know, this is happening worldwide. It's essentially, it's a global movement. Um, I, I'm not sure it's happening worldwide um, in the sense that um, it, it's, not, it's not going to be as, uh, as successful everywhere. Mm-hmm. And as long as that is the case, um, things can, can be picked up uh, it's not necessarily that that the trend can be stopped, but things can be picked up in such a way as the trend to be for the trend to be stopped. Uh, it's um, reminiscent of whatever happened in during the World War II, let's say, or under communism. Uh, but there's but there's a very very relevant uh, fact that that a very relevant uh, situation that needs to occur for that to be to be the case which is reverting to the national paradigm, to the nation state as being the, the locus of politics. Um, and, and you can look, you can see that by determining, uh, uh, again, by looking at, at what they consider to be their, uh, their, their worst enemy, the way in which they dilute national identity and, and national uh, Manifestations, let's say the manifestations within political manifestations within the nation state, the way in which th- they take a, a very acute interest in that, tells you that this is their Achilles heel. Mm-hmm. Um, as long as things happen somewhere within the um, where people can still see it, and they and it happens differently, this is something that's that they can't possibly they don't have any any answer to. Um, the global takeover can break at any uh, link in the chain, or it can not, or it can just not happen at all in certain parts that are to be, would have been included in the chain. But people, in order for that to happen, people need to set their minds back to the national paradigm and realize that they can act locally, as the as the left put it back in the day. <laughs> the, <laughs> Right. I mean, uh, uh, um, beat them at their own game. Let's say uh, they they thought in terms of of think globally and act locally, and we would need to do the same. We would need to to um, rehash the tattered constituency that is the nation nation state and realize that that is the locus of our resistance. Um, and it's happening. I don't. I don't need to theorize it as, a, as something that just as something that needs to happen. It's something that people need to look uh, to to identify as happening in various places. Of course, it, it has its it has its uh, um, variance. As in, uh, you look at the the United States, uh, which is a nation state. All of it is a nation state, but I think. In that context, it's more more relevant to to focus on uh, on each individual state component, which have they have worked the same way uh, uh, during the pandemic. Uh, certain states, such as Florida, North Dakota, I think uh, Texas to some degree, they have uh, bombarded the narrative. They have shown that it that it's not like that. That things do not happen the way uh, they're planned, and as long as that you know, as long as we uh, we understand that there's nothing to invent here, there's nothing new to 
to construct, that we all we have to do is find the resources that we used to have and, and identify with the imperfect constituency that best represents us. And as long as that is the way uh, forward, which, which would imply I'm doing a lot of, a lot of stateless libertarianism, mm-hmm. uh, a lot of, uh, of uh, universal socialism, a lot of these ideas that uh, the global elite has been very happy to sponsor in these uh, past uh, 40 years, as long as we d- we look into that and no we we don't have to 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 turn into flag waving nationalists but acknowledge that this is probably the best the best um, locus of uh, of resistance as long as we do that i think i think we're we're on the right path i'm not going to say we're we're out of the woods but we're on the right path this is this is what they fear most and this is the it's actually the easiest way to go about it yeah. Do you believe that there's a kind of a, a, a movement of elites at that level as well? Because, you know, we've been talking about populist energies. People have an intuitive grasp of, of you know, what's going wrong. But are the, are there representatives in kind of the higher echelons that, that mirror these beliefs, that, that would take these people on as a client class and would fight, you know, the, the, the kind of the global agenda? Because that's kind of been my more the... Not, I don't know if disappointing. I mean, it's it, this. This is what I've seen in kind of the circles that I've been through. The people that I went to university with, who who are so-called, you know, kind of Westernized elites from Romania, um, they are very much bought into the you know neoliberal idea. You know, they they would love to live in Brussels. They're you know they're they're fawning over all of this all of this ideology. So, do you see kind of an elite forming that represents these people? Um, at, at that level, yes, I, I would. I mean, um, it's very easy to, to find the counterexamples. Um, everybody who's leading a populist movement is educated in, within the elite movement. Uh, all they have to do, and they generally do, find, uh, generally, the, the people who do that will do it. We, we, we don't have to instruct them to do it. They, they'll just do it. Uh, for instance, uh, Nigel Farage w- worked as a, a trader, was it, for yeah. half of his life. Uh, uh, Viktor Orban was trained by Soros. Well, it's, uh, mm-hmm. well that's uh, that's very a very simplified version of what actually happened. But let's say uh, he was uh, he was educated in the Soros system and then turned against it. And that it's not um, it's not just that it's not inconceivable. It's happening that that these elites do that. But uh, of course, the revelation today is that these people are not elites. Um, or they're not. Well, they're about halfway, or uh, less than halfway, to becoming elites. They are uh, elites only in the in the old national states uh, uh, variant of things. We regard them as elites um, residually by by um, by thinking that that by, by by imagining them to be elites of the relevant constituency, which is the nation state. They are elites under definitions that people provided in the 1920s, where you would send your very best to school abroad, and they would they would come back and help construct the nation state with uh, input from uh, more advanced societies and whatnot. So this is the definition of the elite that we had back then. We still use it to define these people. In some cases, the cases you mentioned, in a rather cartoonish way, because this is precisely what is not happening. Um, but in any case, it's um, as long as the nation state is no longer the relevant constituency, and as long as we notice that the actual elites are transnational, have much more power, much more financial power, um, we have to realize that that when we when we, we discuss whether somebody in the elites is is going to, to help the people, we're talking about people in entirely different circles that we probably never attended, and and people who are under their pressures, their their own kind of pressures. I would I would have to wonder, well, what what can happen to somebody? It's it's not just that they that that people in those circles are associate with each other for uh, doing the same thing, for um, for. Um, Taking the world a certain direction, for ending up in a in a in a in a classless or not classless but uh, incomeless, uh, um, um, uh, currencyless, uh, uh, electronic electronic society uh, ruled by them or uh, benevolently or 
malignantly ruled by them. Uh, people, you know, uh, uh, people who have to account for their carbon credit and whatnot, uh, uh, people who, let's say, are, uh, because they care the envir- the, about the environment, they get to the point where they castrate people. So they, you know, they, they, uh, uh, they have a, a global policy deciding who gets castrated and who doesn't. It's not just that sort of, uh, of uh, you know, not just people in uh, who are consciously following this plan or these uh, um, um, this notion that it, it, society will have to be arranged like that, and it's inevitable that it be arranged like that. It's also people who um, who f- find themselves uh, on the same financial level as these elites, and are uh, hard pressed to find an alternative to that. But what would happen to somebody having different opinions? or a different way to go about things in that sort of environment. We we see it with Elon Musk up to a point, right? He says, well, it does, it's not that the world is overpopulated, it's precisely the other way around. Mm-hmm. But on the other hand, Musk has sent a very alarming message about automation, saying that, uh, um, not just that, he endorses automation up to a point, but he says he said at some point, if I if I remember correctly, that we have had a chance to reg- regulate automation, but it's too late for that. That we're walking into a dystopia and we don't even know it. Mm-hmm. And this looks to me like Elon Musk realizing that there is that other people in his circles are too far advanced for him to stop him, presuming he wants to stop them. That he's going to do that. He's going to do anything active to stop them. He's not. Uh, he's not a uh, an Iron Man for uh, for uh, a constituency of uh, of uh, people who want uh, want things done uh, a better way. He just seems to be there, um, noticing the trend, not being able to to stop it. Doesn't mean that the trend can't be stopped. It probably means that the trend can't be stopped by him. And there's also the fact that. Elon Musk has constructed his entire fortune on uh, subsidies on things that contributed. Yeah, on probably the worst things you could uh, you could uh, you could use to to grow rich. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm a, a, you know Elon Musk is a very conflicting character. I think you know being being someone who spends a lot of time on Twitter, I kind of was relieved at the fact that we you know we might have more um, lenient management. But outside of that, I'm not necessarily sure about him as a as a, a personality. Um, I think he also said something about trying to um, I, I know KYC people just you know to to make sure that there's no anons, no more bots, no nothing, which would essentially just destroy all of the all of the dissident infrastructure because that's. 95% anime avatars, people just, you know, just speaking their mind. Because Not they can. only that, but, but, but it would contribute to uh, the, the net, the, the, the web of social, complete social control. It will destroy any, any form of anonymity that you, you would have and would link your data to whatever, whatever data uh, the state and the corporate system will find relevant about you. Yeah, I mean, I've, having worked in tech, I... <laughs> Like any sort of disclaimer that they give you about how your data is handled, it's just, it's not even worth the paper it's printed on. Like any person in in a tech company can read any of your messages. Um, I'm not sure about, you know, new encrypt, encryption technology, Signal, Telegram, whatever that is, but in a classical messaging system, you know, Alex from sales is reading your messages. <laughs> you know, it's... Uh, I want to add that it used it used to not be that much of a problem. Um, it wasn't, I mean, you would have a, a semi-public interface interface that you would know was not entirely secret, but you would not care about that as long as, well, the moment they would, they would, uh, they would go about uh, telling people what they found out about you privately would, would have exposed them. I would not have, I wouldn't have uh, thought of, uh, of it being plausible maybe 10 years ago, five years ago. That uh, there would they would create a collaboration with other that that these things would lead to a collaboration with other entities that would construct a web of control. 
as long as it was Alex in sales reading my messages, you know, you, you, you can't, it's, it's, uh, it's like somebody reading your letters. It's not like somebody reading your thoughts. It's not like somebody determining from what they've read, what you're going to do or how much of a danger you are to them or whatever. And this is the level, the, the, the innovative level where things are heading with collaboration from 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 high tech the, the from tech the fact that that um tech used to do that on a regular day was probably not much of a problem the fact that they're doing is doing it for these nefarious purposes today is the problem yeah and and a lot of them essentially what they do is they kind of abstract the, the the data points that they have from you and then those data points get into a bigger database that's also sold between these corporations and even if the, they're anonymized you know if they have your tracking cookie if they you know know which browser you come in from and then they serve you whatever advertising or they bar you from different engagements with platforms because you, you've seen this a lot you know deplatforming no more PayPal for you no more banking for you you know uh, you just get kicked out of the, the place where you make money because you know the, the screens is where you make the money now and it's uh yeah it's very easy it, it happens at the push of a button if you're if you're an undesirable you get just uh kicked out instantly and it's a very effective way for them to move forward it's a, to to go to their next uh, the next item on the agenda i don't uh, the example in canada i think tells you everything about what can happen the moment you oppose this again not saying that the that that there's yet no way to oppose it but uh, that that people should should realize how how far things have uh, have uh, penetrated yeah and and coordinate while you still can with um with whoever you still can and Maybe, yeah, just um, uh, diversify. Diversify your connections with people. Diversify where you keep mm -hmm. your money. Diversify the types of currencies you use if you can. Yeah, it's, it's you, you never know what's going to, what's going to give first. Um, yeah, this is, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a bit black filling. I mean, I, uh, I don't know what to think at this point. It's, it's, I don't know, every, every day I get like one, one click more worried about, about what's going on. Well, uh, again, I don't. It, 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 it's probably it. It can also be a case of it's of it being darkest just before the dawn. But uh, but that again, that that would have to entail that we do things a certain way forward. That we we do not uh, we do not accept. Uh, for instance, I I uh, I'm very much for a um, an understanding between. Uh, between the various factions that do note the problem. And it would have to, it, it asks of them that they relinquish certain parts of their mindset, of their ideology, or deprioritize them. Because this is not the moment for uh, ideological purism. Yeah. I would urge libertarians to accept the nation state as a prerequisite, at least up until a, the point where we, we have normalized back enough and legitimize the system back enough to where we can question its uh, its inner workings. Um, whatever we're facing is so much worse than uh, whatever libertarians identified as bad up to this point that it's probably worth reconsidering what they're opposing. Yeah. I, I do see a, a very strong wave um, away from libertarianism. I mean, I was part of that wave when it started. And now I feel like, you know, the, the, the mass of people who would still identify as libertarian and cap or whatever, minarchist or something like that, is dwindling. Um, not, not that many people. It's just because when you're confronted with the, the kind of the naked wall of power just pushing against you, year after year after year, um, you know, the NAP is just like, I don't know, sitting naked in the storm, just to add to, to weird uh, metaphors. The NAP was probably, I mean, uh, <laughs> it's a childish concept on a good it's, day. It's <laughs> lovely, but it's like, uh, what, you need robots, not humans. Like humans, humans deal in power, humans deal in, in, in many things and you can't just, uh, you know, throw out uh, human nature and, and expect, you know, people to behave. 
Yeah, it's uh, it's it, it is great though. I mean, it's I can see why it appeals to a certain kind of linear thinker where it's like, okay, this would be mathematically a very good solution mm -hmm. if we just you know do a little napkin calculation of what the best solution would be. Um, but the reality is that life is very complex. And in any case, the mathematical input in that, the pseudo mathematical input in, input in that, is the only intellectual contribution to what was otherwise a the, the golden rule of Christianity. Uh, the fact that that Christianity does not and does not claim to guarantee results, as in, it, it doesn't say uh, just because we proclaim the violence to be wrong, uh, it doesn't mean that that violence is not gonna, going to happen. Whereas the libertarian with, with their pseudo-mechanical, uh, uh, pseudo-mathematical um, notion, which is probably, I want to just mention, it's, it's, in, it's entirely absent from the writings of um, libertarian classics. I'm not going to find it there. It's a recent input by uh, sophists who wanted things to, to, to move a certain way, to be moved to a certain position. Um, but the fact that, that this is the only, but, but uh, this is the only, the, the only intellectual input of libertarianism to what was otherwise a common sense rule. But just because it, it's common sense, it doesn't mean that it will happen. The, 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 the false guarantee by libertarians that once you proclaim it, it will happen. is probably the only intellectual contribution. Uh, once, you, once you remove it, the expectation that things will happen a certain way, you can get back to a very uh, normal and, and um, balanced society where you understand human behavior as being the norm and the norm to protect the imperfection of society, which the Christian mindset accepts, uh, is something that, that ideologists, including libertarians, need to, to reintegrate into their system and, and de-ideologize their expectations. And this goes, I wanted to, to complete, and it's not just a, an anti-libertarian rant, it's also a, uh, an anti-lefty rant. Um, the honest left, the populist left, the non-Marxist left, I, even the non-social democratic left, the left that is, whatever is left of the left that uh, that that has a uh, a mindset that's based on protecting work and the interest of working men and women, uh, whatever is left of that, uh, whatever isn't uh, mimicking leftist values, uh, can and should and probably already does in a spontaneous way accept uh, the free market and the outcomes of the free market as being more relevant to advancing um, working class interests than um, in intervention by the state. Because once they accept intervention by the state as, as having risks that are incalculable, um, leftists can can fold back on a cooperative dimension of leftist thought, mutualist uh, dimension of leftist thought. Of course, many will say, well, it's imperfect. The state will have to intervene and regulate, which at that point becomes a, a rather benign point. Right? Once you reinvent the state, re-legitimize the state, recreate it into small manageable structures, maybe state intervention will not be that, uh, that problematic. And you, you will revert to the bureaucratic system that you had in the 19th century and that everybody lived with, no matter how, uh, how uh, ridiculous it was at, some, at, at points. But you would just have that. And uh, I think that, that the generic notion that, that you could fold back on, on values that people, and this is the, the general conservative point that I'm making, the, the, the relevant of, uh, part of the conservatism that that I adhere to, in fact, the only conservatives that, that I adhere to is to get back to a pragmatic solution that worked back in the 19th century, let's say. And, uh, and in order to have to achieve that, you would have to have an agreement on, on uh, scaling back on both sides, on the libertarian right and the populist left, the populist right as well. Scaling back to where the state was a long time ago, not expecting uh, either the science fiction of libertarianism or the 
um, managerial um, the, the 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 pathway to managerial democracy that that the leftist mindset always seems to be to be prone to accepting. Yes. Um, and I think uh, again, I'm theorizing something that I think may already be happening spontaneously between people who who come to see eye to eye on these things. And and my um, original uh, rant, the one that you mentioned about uh, about. Uh, how things were planned in advance involves, uh, I think, I think the, the easiest way to see planning or at least approximating, uh, uh, targeting certain groups and getting them to act a certain way. The easiest way to see how that has happened is to look at the polarization of, of right and left. Not just the polarization, but the polarization around the most inane uh, concepts on either side getting libertarians to focus on things that can never be achieved and getting the left to, to focus on maintaining things that are very, very, um, let's say they're very profitable to people who want things to go a certain way. Getting the left to contribute in the destruction of the working class and getting the uh, right to contribute in in uh, in um, defending uh, crony capitalism as a better alternative to socialism, when in fact they were marginally the same, and in getting them to to identify the to to only the, the, uh, as an alternative to only settle for an absolute utopia that was legitimized as if it were real, achievable, there just around the corner. You spend much more time trying to convince a libertarian about the relevant benefits of the nation state than you would have had at any point in history up to now. Yeah. It's, a... it, 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 it's sending, sending everybody on a wild goose chase while, while the people arrange their, uh, their mediocre business in the, in the shadows. Yeah, I, th- I think this is also kind of down- downstream from um, from a certain type of technology and a certain kind of politics as entertainment, um, where you know people just like the, the the jousting aspect of it, where you know you just and the uh, make belief aspect of, uh, aspect of it, the um, castles in Spain, the um, w- we, your 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 voice is relevant. You're in a democracy. And it's the more relevant, the more you can construct uh, ideal spaces in your mind and put them in print. This is the mentality that has been encouraged maybe 20 years back. Yeah. And it's, uh, uh, the, I think the, I don't think the, unlike many people, I don't think the, the people pulling the strings today are the cultural Marxists or Marxists or any kind. But I do think the, the core contribution of Marxism in this uh, this uh, uh, race to the bottom, has been this polarization of the right and left. Uh, it it was a very conscious attempt on the part of Marxists and particularly Leninists to drive a wedge in the middle of a normal civilized society to um, introduce uh, their very uh, inflammatory uh, rhetoric and and mindset as uh, a normal component of politics to even suggest that there were marxist forms of marxism which were at the center not at the not even at the left they were at the center of of political discourse and uh, then it was a game of mimicry people who wanted to to obtain similar results to to marxism which were to destroy society as we know it those people just mimicked the methods. Yeah. And um, in some cases, um, there were in fact people who were, uh, as the expression is, trained Marxists. People who, um, for instance, people who had background in, in Marxism, who reverted, who publicly denounced Marxism, but we always thought they did it for reasons, for liberal reasons, let's say. And they were doing it because they realized that Marxism was imperfect at achieving absolute power, which it is. 
because Marxism, as paradoxical as it may sound, has its own set of ethics, the do's and don'ts. And it's a paradox. We, we, somebody renounces Marxism because, uh, we would assume because Marxism is dictatorial, it's totalitarian, but in fact, they renounced it because it's not totalitarian enough. Mm. And uh, I will urge um, people to go and read whatever Orwell had to write before, 19, before writing 1984, uh, which were reviews of books by uh, the very early neoliberals of the day. I forget the name of the author. Um, in any case, it's uh, one of the one of the uh, the core ideologists of, of neoliberalism and global neoliberalism. And uh, Orwell reviewed his books and realized that they were even more dystopian than Marxism. And I would wager that this is why he actually wrote 1984 to not to discuss, as we were told for many years, not to discuss the perils of communism, which everybody knew by that point but to discuss, to make a novel point, which was about a totalitarianism that is not even communism, cannot be called communism, emerging um, in England in, and in the West in general, in England as the landing stripe for, for a, a bigger Western world, um, emerging there uh, just as justified by the threat of communism, on, on one hand, and on the other, by mimicking its governance methods. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that is interesting because I feel like that's uh, that you know echoes back to the the book that I mentioned before, the the book by Richard Legutko, which is essentially just just the fact that he's he's kind of an older, he's an MEP, um, and from Poland, and mm -hmm. essentially he's lived through almost the entirety of Pol Polish communism and now from neoliberals being in politics. And essentially this was his observation that, um, you know, it essentially for, for Poland, communism was just a, um, a preparation for things to come, a mental boot camp for, for an ideology that you think you've rejected, but actually, you know, the seeds were just planted. I, I don't think that, that it's a, or I, rather I, I would, I would think that it's a very, um, a very um, unusual point. I mean, it requires an unusual investment, intellectual investment, to assume that that this is uh, communism born again. This is uh, people who who uh, uh, are hiding their red flags and putting out uh, uh, rainbow flags uh, or whatever. Uh, the same people with the same ideology with the same intent. Yeah. It's probably people people who have very similar intent looking at others as being unsuccessful and imperfect. One of the things to notice is the is the very um that some of them has have a very uh, uniquely anti not just well we did mention that there's a very anti-Russian rhetoric which appeals to the, to the notion that that Russia is the problem and the Russians are the problem. There's also a very anti-communist rhetoric which would, of course, be welcomed unless it's for people who want, who, who believe that communism was not communist enough. It, it, this is very familiar, should be very familiar to Romanians, and we can familiarize the, your international audience to it as well, that Romania uh, is probably at the forefront of that, of that sort of transformation. Um, we have had for decades a, a critique of um, what they call national communism, again, the, the, the latest stage of, uh, or the latter stage of, of, of uh, communism in Romania, where it got blended, it returned to the, uh, para the nation, nation state paradigm, it reverted to some normalcy in discourse, it um, golded nationalist sentiment, it... Um, it, it, it even veered into racism in some forms of it, some extreme forms of it. Um, and it survived in the post-revolutionary era as the ideology, ideology of, of parties who were openly nationalist rather than openly communist. It was such a big component of Romanian communism that it remained the one component of Romanian, uh, of, of um, 
of Roman of, of uh, let's say far right Romanian politics into the 1990s. Uh, but um, what I want to say is that ever since the 1990s, we have had a, a left wing and liberal uh, discourse attacking Romanian communism, but not attacking it because it was communist, attacking it because it was nationalist. And this is, um, you you find yourself in a situation where you would have to defend the nationalist component of, of Romanian communism simply because that sort of, of critique is not just unfair, it's, it's um, how should I put it, it's, uh, um, manipulative. For instance, um, I, uh, Westerners, I'm sure, are familiar with, um, um, because whenever it comes to, to um, whenever it comes to abortion debates in uh, in the West as of late, uh, uh, Americans uh, get to hear, or Canadians get to hear, that in Romania they banned abortion, and these were the results. Uh, and you, the, the way in which they, they simplify and manipulate that story and make it seem like, um, like, like uh, um, Ceausescu was, was a, in that situation, like he was a religious conservative, um, uh, using that, that regime paradigm, that communist regime paradigm to malign uh, religious conservatives in Romania. In, in, sorry, in throughout the world, by appealing to the, by by using the, the paradigm in Romania, um, also absurdly um, citing uh, pseudo facts about so many women having lost their lives to uh, to let's say botched abortions at home, which is of course it's tragic, but. It, it's not like there was an absolute imperative not to keep the child, right? And it's, we're not talking about a, a conscious crime of the communist regime. It's not like they took out these women and shot them in the head. Uh, and then having to to know that, that Ceausescu did this for natalistic reasons, that he couldn't care less about... Like, we are in agreement here up to a point... Uh, that he couldn't care less about the lives of the children involved. That once they uh, they were born, they were uh, um, they were not protected in any way. Many of them, some ended up in orphanages where they were uh, mistreated and even left to die. Um, but that this happened simply because I mean, a, a religious conservative's attitude to that is that no, no, we. We, we would keep the children, we would look after them. Um, but in any case, um, in these and other situations, you would have to at least defend the, 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 uh, the narrative about the regime that, that at least makes sense, that, that, that corresponds to historical facts. Simply because the way in which they, told, they sold you the story about the, the, uh, this... Uh, 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 the, the Ceausescu regime is is so skewed, and even even to the level where they actually, you would have to assume that um, in in the two stages of communism, the nationalist stage was so bad that it eclipsed the internationalist stage. When in the internationalist stage, uh, people were simply shot by the by the dozens. Um, uh, uh, communist uh, camps and prisons were filled to the brim with with uh, with people rounded up uh, in the streets. There was the the infamous uh, re-education experiment, and all that. All the absolute evils of Romanian communism are actually confined to a pre-nationalist uh, stage. And what they did was that they convinced you that the component that's relevant in communism is the nationalist one, and that this is responsible for. Uh, for the most evil perpetrated, evils perpetrated, when in fact it, it probably is uh, the other way around. Yeah, well, it it fits within kind of this um, almost like the global metaphysics now, which is 
anti-fascism. It's, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's liberalism, but it's, you know, like a uh, previous guest, uh, Taba777 said, you know, the, 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 the ruling ideology of the West is anti-fascism, whatever kind of fills those gaps. And, um, yeah, the, the, the myth of, 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 of the nationalist communists is, is probably much more effective because it just, you know, it goes with the flow of, of what, what's already out in the ether. Um, I know we're coming up on time a little bit. Uh, I want to ask you the last question, which is the, the question of the show. Everyone gets asked this question is, um, do you have a, a thinker who was influential in, in how you think now uh, that you think people um, underestimate or is underrated by, by others and they, they would do well by, by reading or looking into? Um, yeah, actually, uh, uh, I would recommend that everyone um, give a try to reading uh, this uh, fellow named, by the name of William Gerardi, um, specifically uh, God's Fifth Column is his uh, 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 um, relevant work of uh, um, a mixture of biography and philosophical musings written maybe in the 19, I think in the 1950s as a, as a Samizdat, a manuscript in, uh, uh, that he kept to himself and was published a long time after his death. And it's a, it's a very, it's a unique look at the history of Europe and, uh, and God's uh, intervention into it. Even if you don't agree with it, it's a beautiful, beautiful work of literature and, uh, and, worth um, worth uh, rediscovering, let's say. But uh, other than that, I mean, uh, we, people should always, uh, sh- should, should go back to reading their Orwell, I think. That's, uh, and, and reading it with, um, without the mindset of, uh, that we were given in, in the last uh, 20 to 40 years, reading it as if for the first time, and seeing what he actually meant by, by, by everything in 1984, and maybe homage to Catalonia as well. Yeah, it's it is interesting that uh, you know Orwell wrote much more than, than 1984, and I think um, he was engaging with a lot of the ideas that are now um, kind of trending again, or trending on the dissident right. You know, he was uh, he wrote a critique of Burnham. He there's there's a lot of essays that. Um, you know, might or you may or may not disagree with, but he was there and he was thinking about these things way before everything that, you know, we're probably now talking about, 90% of what we're talking about uh, has Especially happened. The, the Burnham essay is what I meant to, to, to what I mentioned earlier. I couldn't remember his name. Yes, people should read the Burnham essays, the two Burnham essays. Oh, that's interesting. Because now, now, I mean, what I read, I read by Burnham is, um, you know, the, the Machiavellians and kind of the death of the West. And he is, he, I think he, he might be seen as a kind of a tied into neoconservatism or people who, who flowed into neoconservatism afterwards. But now he's essentially one of the kind of the people who um, are the core of the reactionary canon. I've got like a whole reading list and Burnham's at the top. Uh, at, at least, you know, you could see these ideas from all sorts of angles, but it's interesting that that you've, uh, you know, perceived him as kind of a, a cedar of a neoliberalism. But to be honest, yeah, it's, uh, it, it could be. Well, there are two stages to him, apparently, from the few that I know about him. Uh, I perceived him mainly through Orwell. I haven't read his book. Yeah, he used to be a Trotskyist. That's kind of his mm-hmm. his core um, where where he started. And then he had a almost a change of heart. He became very interested in uh, elite theory and he wrote this book, The Machiavellians, where he you know mm-hmm. looks into Pareto, Mosca, and Machiavelli, um, and just uh, kind of breaks down um, I don't know, well, politics along uh, formalist lines and you know what what you know actually is is happening and you know just just essentially breaking down the elite theorists um which is yeah very trending in in the circles that I'm in, that I'm in and I think it's a really interesting it's definitely the most um startling book of political theory that I've ever read so <laughs> it's uh, definitely recommended <laughs> well Again, people should also read the Orwell Critique. Yes, please do. Please do. <laughs> read the Orwell <laughs> Critique. Um, thank you so much, Dan. This was uh, this was wonderful. It's been a long time coming. Um, uh, I hope people got as much out of it as I have because, uh, yeah, you're you're always a fountain of wisdom. Uh, you're not. You are. Are you on Twitter or you're not? No, no. 
don't spend that much time on Twitter. It's just, that's the thing, you know, in, in Romania, if you want to get political analysis or anything, you have to go to Facebook. That's where people hang out. Uh, Twitter is, uh, yeah, some people, I've, I've had a few people on Twitter from Romania, but they're just in my DMs and just like, I don't know, harassing me for being a Putin <laughs> shill or something like that. But yeah, not, not happy. Anyway, um, yeah. I'm very happy that you finally came on and uh, thank you so much. Thank you as well. It's been great.